In this video, we're going to take a look at the concept of a sampling distribution and how to apply the central limit theorem. So let's begin by considering this population of five piglets that we are going to uniquely label. So we are interested in the weight of the piglets. So what we start off with is by weighing each piglet individually and recording their weight in kilograms. So we find that now we have a population of five weights from our piglets. So we can calculate the population average value and we find that it's 1.78 kilograms. So what if we decide to look at a sample of two piglets at a time from our population. So we can take the weight of each of the piglets in the pair that we sample and we calculate the sample average. So we find that this value for the first pair, this value of 1.2, is a point estimate for the population average mu. Now we may be interested in knowing how many possible samples we can collect from this population of five. So using our combination rules, we find that the number of possible samples, which we're going to refer to as K, is going to be the population size N combination sample size small n. So for our example here, we're going to have K equals to five combination two, and that gives us 10 samples. So from the 10 pairs, we are going to calculate X bar. And as you can see, the values of X bar are different. So this X bar is actually a random variable and it's not fixed. So we've just made use of this small population to show the principle of all possible samples. So now if we consider our population of five piglets, we were able to take samples of size two at a time and we were able to calculate our value of X bar, our sample mean. So in this case, we have 10 estimates for our population proportion mu. And we can see that X bar is a random variable. So in this case, all the values of the mean have a distribution that we're going to refer to as the sampling distribution of the mean. So we know that the population average value is 1.785 kilo, 1.78 kilograms. So what we can do is we can also look at the expected value of X bar, which is the mean of X bar. And we find that this is simply the average of all the point estimates for the population mean mu, which is going to be the sum of X bar I divided by our value of K, which is the number of samples that we were able to use, which is 10 in this case. And we find that that value is 1.78, which is equal to the population mean. So in this case, X bar is referred to as an unbiased estimator for the population mean, simply because the expected value of X bar is equal to the population parameter mu. Now we know that from the samples of size two that we took a look at, we saw that the expected value of X bar was the same as the population average mu, which was 1.78. Now, if we calculated the standard deviation, we find that the standard deviation is 0 0.34. If we increase our sample size to three, then we have 10 possible samples. The mean of X bar is still the same 1.78. And if we calculate the standard deviation, we find it's 0 0.23. If we take samples of size four, in this case, we have five possible samples. The mean remains the same, but the standard deviation now is 0 0.14. So as we can see, when we increase our sample sizes, our standard deviation is, in, is decreasing simply because we find that the sample size is getting closer and closer to the population size. Therefore, the distribution of the sample means is not as scattered away from the 
true mean as we would expect, but they're actually much closer to the true mean. So the variability decreases. And that's why we find that the standard deviation becomes smaller when you increase your sample size. So if we look at this population where we're interested in the diastolic blood pressure, then if we calculate the mean, we find that the mean is 78. And this value is fixed because we took the measurement of each individual and we used it to calculate the mean. But if we take our samples, we find that, for example, in this first sample, the sample average is 75. For the second one, the sample average is 67. And for the, for the third one, the sample average is 71.3. So in actual fact, we can see that the sample average is not fixed across all the samples, but it's actually a variable. So our next question that we're going to answer is, what does the distribution of these sample averages look like? So now let's define X bar as the sample average of a random sample of size N from any population. So this means that we could be working with a population that comes from a discrete distribution, such as the binomial distribution or even the discrete uniform distribution, or it could come from any continuous distribution, such as the T distribution, which is symmetric, or even the chi-squared distribution, which is positively skewed. So now we can define the sampling distribution of X bar and the sampling distribution of X bar is approximately normal for a large sample. And in this case, large sample implies that your sample size should be at least 30. And we can use shorthand notation and show that X bar has an approximate. And the approximate part is shown by the squiggly line with a top, with a dot at the top. And it's approximately normal with a mean mu, which is the same as our population mean, and a variance of sigma squared x bar. And the x bar shows us that we are working with our sample average. So the expected value of x bar is equal to the population mean mu. And because of this property, then we can state that x bar is an unbiased estimator of mu. Now, when it comes to the standard deviation of X bar, we have two formulas, and this is dependent on the type of population we're working with. So for the final population, we define the standard deviation as the square root of capital N minus small n divided by capital N minus one. And this capital N is our population size, and the small n is our sample size. And we multiply this by sigma over root n. And the sigma in the numerator is your population standard deviation. Now, this factor here is what we call the finite population correction factor. Now, when it comes to the infinite population, then we find that sigma x bar is defined as sigma over the square root of n. So in the case where you have a large sample, a large population in comparison to your sample, which could be very small, then we find our finite population correction factor is approximately one. And therefore we end up using the second formula or rather formula B. And in the case where you have the proportion of your sampled population, which is given as small n over capital N being less than or equal to 0.05 or 5%, then we also end up using our second formula B. Now let's take a look at this example where we have our random variable X that comes from a population that is uniformly distributed as can be seen on this graph here. So we start off by taking samples and we're interested in the sample averages and the distribution of the sample averages. So when we take samples of size five, we can see from the plot of the histogram that the sample means are not uniformly distributed, but neither do they have a definitive shape. 
So when we increase the sample size to 15, we can see that our distribution of the sample means is not symmetric. It's slightly skewed to the left and the spread of the sample means is also still large. But when we get to our sample of size 30, then we can see that the spread of the distribution of our sample means is now smaller and it's approximately normal. And when we get to our sample of size 50, we also find that the distribution is approximately normal. And now the sample means are more clustered to a central position because the spread is now smaller. In this example here, we find that our population comes from a distribution that is positively skewed. And so if we start taking samples once more and we look at the sample means, then we can see when we have a sample of size 5, the distribution is still slightly skewed to the right and the spread is still large. And when we increase the sample size to 15, we can see that the spread or rather the variability of the sample means is now decreasing. And when we get to a sample of size 30, then the distribution of the sample means is approximately normal and the spread is very small. And when we increase our sample size to 50, then the spread is even smaller because now the variability has decreased and our sample means are more clustered closer to the population mean. So in our next video, we're going to take a look at how to apply the characteristics of the sampling distribution of the sample mean.